poverty is normally defined in one of two ways. First of all, there's absolute poverty, which is when someone lacks one or more of their basic physiological needs, such as food, water, clothing, or shelter. The World Bank, for example, uh, set the level of poverty as anyone living on under $2.50 per day. Then there is relative poverty, which is a more social definition rather than a physiological definition, because social, uh, sorry, relative poverty uh, signifies when someone is significantly below the average income um, of that country or that society, often calculated as someone living on less than half of the average uh, income um, in the country. In Britain, it's actually calculated as anyone living on 60% or less of the median income in the country. So in the UK, the median income is uh, £27,000 uh, per year. So 60% of that is about 16000 Anyone uh, with an income of 16000 or less, which is about 20% of the population of the UK, would be considered to be living in relative poverty. Um, that is uh, significantly below the living standards um, of the average citizen. However, it's unlikely in the UK that there are many people living in absolute poverty and certainly very few uh, living in extreme poverty, which is defined by the World Bank as anyone living on uh, $1.90 or less per day. However, both these definitions, both absolute poverty and relative poverty, they're both economic definitions um, which define poverty according to a certain uh, uh, level of income, effectively. And such economic definitions have been criticised as a measure of poverty by people such as Amartya Sen, a development economist, who argues that poverty arises from a failure not just to uh, meet a certain level of income, but from a failure to meet non-material needs as well. Um, so uh, for, for, for such um, thinkers, then <clears throat> poverty is, uh, is defined in terms of restricted opportunities, um, and lack of freedom, particularly lack of positive freedom. The idea of positive freedom is the idea of a type of freedom that enables you um, to fully realize your capacities as an individual. So if, a, if an individual is not able to really truly realize their ambitions and their goals to the best of their abilities, to fully develop their individual talents and capacities, then that person would said to be uh, not free. And for a development economist like Amartya Sen, if you're not free in that sense, then you're not really uh, f fully developed as an individual. You're said to be in some sense impoverished, even if in a non-material sense. You might have all your physiological needs met, but if you don't have that freedom, you're not really said to be, um, for these critics, genuinely uh, um, out of poverty. So, so that problematizes, that complicates our understanding of poverty. Both absolute and relative poverty are economic definitions of poverty. But here we have the idea that poverty can be defined by non-material factors as well. And this brings us to, well, what do we mean by development? Um, development is often thought to be defined by the absence of poverty. A developed country is one in which there's very little poverty. Um, but what exactly do we mean by development? And again, it can be thought of in purely economic terms which is the kind of traditional, what we call the orthodox view of development, um, <clears throat> which would define development in terms of a country's level of GDP, for example, gross domestic product, the total value of goods and services produced in a country. Um, so again, this would define development as, as, as simply a certain level of income or wealth. Um, but again, such purely economic measures of development have been criticised um, for three main reasons. Firstly, these measures are, are said to tell us nothing about the levels of inequality within a society. Uh, so they can tell us if a country has high GDP, uh, okay, we know there's a lot of wealth being produced in that country, but what we don't know is how evenly that wealth has been distributed. Uh, so it could be, for example, that there's a class of wealthy elites um, who are hoarding most of that wealth for themselves, whilst the vast majority are actually lacking um, even perhaps the basic necessities. So by this token, the purely economic definitions of, of, of development, such as GDP levels, not only don't ask, tell us about levels of inequality, but they don't actually tell us about levels of poverty either. It could be that all that wealth is being hoarded by a few, 
and a lot of people are living in poverty. Just a, cr a crass measure like GDP, or even per capita GDP, which is GDP divided by population, doesn't tell us about the levels of poverty and inequality in a country. Um, secondly, <clears throat> uh, economic measures of development don't tell us anything about the value of the so-called informal economy. These are non-financial contributors to, to, the, to the economy. Um, things that actually, you know, work that uh, produces valuable goods, useful goods that improve people's living standards, but are not actually uh, monetarily rewarded, that are not paid. So, for example, the uh, uh, a lot of farmers in the Global South are what we call subsistence farmers. Um, this is where they're growing food primarily to eat, not to sell, but to eat. Um, <clears throat> now, this activity does not contribute to monetary wealth as such. If you're not selling it, it's not contributing to monetary income, and therefore it's not measured by purely economic indicators such as GDP. Um, and yet, it makes a significant difference, obviously, to people's living standards. If they're producing food that they're able to consume, um, then that's making a difference to their living standards, but it's not picked up by purely monetary measures of development. Similarly, the domestic, unpaid domestic uh, labor usually performed by women, uh, childcare primarily, um, and you know, cooking and cleaning and so on and so forth, just domestic labor, which is typically unpaid, also is not um, measured and captured by economic indicators such as GDP. Um, and this has led some, uh, in including for example, most obviously feminist scholars, to conclude that there's actually a gender bias inherent in measures, economic measures such as GDP. Um, because they tend to privilege the type of work, the paid, monetarily paid work that's typically performed by men, whilst uh, making invisible, invisibilizing the typically unpaid work normally performed by women. Uh, the third criticism of purely economic indicators of development is that it tells us nothing about levels of political freedom, civil liberties, respect for human rights, and so on. So, for example, uh, in a country such as uh, Saudi Arabia, um, it may have a very high GDP, very high per capita GDP, for example, um, but actually there is limited uh, civil liberties, limited human rights, um, and so on, very severe uh, restrictions on political organizing and so on. Uh, so, again, for development economists like Amartya Sen, um, these political liberties are actually an intrinsic part of what it means to be a developed country. And if a country does not have these, they can't be truly said to be developed. Uh, so this, this would be the, the third criticism. And this links to the idea, again, of positive freedom. That to be truly free, and that for a developed country, should be measured in terms of how free its citizens are. Uh, those citizens need to be free to develop their capacities as individuals, their talents and so on. If there are severe restrictions on political engagement and so on, then obviously that's a restriction on that kind of freedom. To finish off this talk, I want to talk then about um, the concept of human development. So these critics of purely economic measures of development, um, th these kind of criticisms have fed into the idea of what we call human development. Uh, and this is m measured by an annual survey by the United Nations called the Human Development Index. And what the Human Development Index does is it ranks all the countries in the world, at least all those it can get data for, in the 2016 uh, index, I think there are 188 countries listed. Um, and it ranks them all uh, according to a whole range of uh, criteria, um, including per capita GDP, but also including things like levels of access to water, to clean water, to education, to healthcare, to, to um, it measures life expectancy and infant mortality, it even measures things like gender uh, equality and so on and so forth. So it, it, it uh, combines all of these different measures to produce one figure for each country, it ranks them in order. Top of the index uh, last year was Norway, um, and bottom of the index was the Central African Republic. Uh, so, and what's really interesting about the Human Development Index is that it's, there may be countries that have very high levels of per capita GDP that actually come out quite low on the Human Development Index, and vice versa. Uh, 
Um, so a classic example of a country with fairly low levels of GDP, but that, which always ranks quite highly in terms of human development, would be Cuba. Now, Cuba is a poor developing country. It's a country in the global south. It's had a, a sanctions on it uh, for many decades, which has hindered its ability to develop through trade and so on. Um, it's a poor country, uh, and yet because it's a communist country, it's the, that wealth is very evenly shared. So the whole population has access to good, good uh, free healthcare and education, for example, but also clean water and so on. Uh, so a country like Cuba um, always comes out high on the human development index, although being a poor country in terms of GDP. So it's a good, it's a good example to show how uh, GDP does not necessarily always the same thing as actually an, a, a population that has good access to the things they need, uh, both in terms of their material and their non-material needs such as education. So in summary, <coughs> poverty is normally defined either as absolute poverty, where you, which means a lack of one or more of your basic physiological needs, food, water, clothing and shelter, um, or as relative po poverty, defined as uh, uh, sig being significantly, uh, having living standards significantly below the average living standards for your country or your society. However, both of these are economic, purely economic um, measures of poverty, um, and there are non-economic. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, there are arguments that poverty is about non-economic factors as well, non-material factors, such as a lack of freedom, a lack of positive freedom in particular, lacking opportunities to de fully develop one's uh, capacities and, and talents as an individual. And <clears throat> in a similar way, development can be defined both in purely economic terms as orthodox, the orthodox view of development does, um, measured essentially by things like the level of GDP of a country, but it can also, uh, but these economic um, definitions have been criticized um, for three reasons, being it's because they tell us nothing about the levels of inequality and the poverty in a country, they tell us not, they don't take into account the informal economy, uh, such as unpaid domestic work normally performed by women, such as subsistence farming. And thirdly, economic measures do not take into account levels of political freedom, respect for civil liberties, respect for human rights, and so on. 